are number two. How precious are your thoughts to me. How countless, Lord, they are. More than the shores have grains of sand, more than the skies have stars. Psalm 139 says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any grievous way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. And that song we just sang is a, a summary of Psalm 139. But that is the heart that we should have this morning. As we come to worship together. As we come to hear God's word together and pray together. Is that, Lord, search me. Find any sin in my heart and help me to cast it out, to forsake it, to abandon it, and lead me in the way everlasting. Well, welcome to Newcastle Bible Church this morning, and if you're a visitor with us, we want to extend a special welcome to you. If you would, at this moment, just grab your worship folder that hopefully you grabbed as you walked in the door. Inside that worship folder, you'll find all sorts of information about what's going on in the church, but you'll also find this little check-in card. And if you would be willing to just take a moment to fill that out, let us know you're here. We would so appreciate that. On the back of that card, you can let us know any prayer requests or praises that you have, and we'd love to pray and praise the Lord alongside you. When you're done with that card at the end of the service, you can stick it in the uh, white tables at either entrance. There's a little slot that you can just slide it in. If you're a visitor with us, I would really encourage you to take that card and just outside these doors, we have a welcome desk, and you can take it there and give it to them. They'd love to greet you, to get to know you, answer any questions you have, and give you a gift. And if you don't like to use paper, we have an app for that, and you can check in and do all that from the phone app that we have available that you can download for free. Now, I don't have any announcements other than to say I'm super excited that we're going to have baptisms. So, I'm going to turn it over to Pastor Phipp right now, who's going to take it away and lead us in having a baptism. Good morning, Newcastle. It's a curious thing to me that uh, the Lord has left us with two ordinances, baptism and the Lord's table. One was instituted at the very beginning of our Lord's ministry, and the other was instituted at the very end of the Lord's ministry ministry. And both of them look toward our Lord's death on the cross. The communion table involves two elements, the bread and the cup, and they signify something about our Lord's body and his sacrifice on the cross. The baptismal service points to 
his obedience to the Lord, because he asked John, this do in, in, to fulfill all righteousness, and it um, speaks of our Lord's death and his burial and his resurrection. So we do that and we act that out when we are baptized. I've always loved the Lord's leadership way. Our Lord didn't just say, you go over here and do this and you go do that. Our Lord set the example. And what he asks us to do, he did himself and he did it first. So we are followers of the Lord. We are obedient and we are followers. We obey when we obey his command to be baptized, this do, and we are involved in, in taking his example for ourselves and identifying ourselves with it so that we do something that enacts the death and the burial and the resurrection of our Savior and we do as he did. And now he says, you go into all the world and make disciples and baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. We're going to do that this morning. I want to introduce to you Tyler, Tyler Hubert. One good guy. You did it. Not slipping on the way in, that was one of the biggest. Yes. To make sure I didn't slip. Okay. Now tell us, Tyler, what brings you today to be baptized and how did all of this come about? Sure. So, church, my name is Tyler Hubert, as Pastor Summers mentioned, and my wife Jennifer and I have attended Newcastle for a couple years now. We have two handsome boys, Calvin and Neil. Most of you have probably heard them, whether you know it or not, at some point during first <laughs> service. Just before COVID hit, Jen and I attended a membership class, and we believe then and still do that this is the right church family for us to be a part of and to grow our and our son's faith in God. But I really drug my feet filling out the membership application. To be honest, I was unsure about this baptism thing. See, I was baptized as an infant and confirmed as a teen, and I really struggled with why I needed to be submerged as an adult. So I started asking questions of a few members and leaders here I have come to have a relationship with, and there were three reasons that became really clear to me as to why I wanted to be baptized. One is it's part of our faith journey. One of the mental hurdles I had to get over was trying to figure out if being baptized as an adult or when I was confirmed as a teen is when I was saved. The truth is, it's neither. Ephesians 2 verse 8, the Bible states, For it is by grace that you have been saved, through faith. And this is not from yourselves, it is a gift from God, not by works, so that one cannot boast. So the act of me being baptized here today does not mean I am saved, but rather through my faith in Christ. This is the part of my faith journey, right? And this is me recommitting to my faith, and it is about me continuing to prioritize my walk with and belief in God as number one in my life. Secondly, I want to publicly admit and identify that through Christ's death and resurrection, I have a path to salvation. We cannot conquer death and have eternal life unless we believe in a Savior that has already done that. Mm -hmm. By being baptized, I claim, I believe in the Lord's death and resurrection, and through that, I have a path to salvation. And the final and most important reason to me that I want to be baptized is because God wants us to. In Matthew 28, verse 19, Jesus states, Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Jesus wanted the disciples to go and baptize believers, which means he wants me, a believer, to be baptized. What I've come to realize over the last couple months is no matter the reason or the excuse I come up with, church, when the Lord wants us to do something, what else really matters? So the final reason I stand before you today is an act of obedience. Hmm. Lastly, I'll just make myself available. If anybody out there is kind of going through where I was a few months ago, um, Jennifer and I regularly attend first service. I'm not going to say I have all the answers or I'll know exactly what to tell you, but I can at least point you in the direction of people who help me. And so again, I'll, I'll just make myself available. If you have questions, if you're where I was a few months ago, come talk to me.
Church, pray with me. Father God, thank you for this beloved young man. Thank you for his faith in Christ, his testimony. Thank you for his obedience to you and to our Lord's command. We now baptize him in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit in, in agreement with your word and your desires. And we do so gladly in the name of Jesus, your Son. Amen. Tyler, having heard your profession of faith, I gladly baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Thank you, brother. Thank you a whole bunch. Would you please stand with us and let's celebrate the common denominator we all have in that baptism testimony is that Christ has saved us this morning. Magnificent, marvelous, matchless love, too vast and astounding to tell. Forever existing in worlds above, now offered and given to all. O fountain of beauty eternal, the Father, the Spirit, the Son, sufficient and endlessly generous, magnificent, marvelous, matchless love. is brimming with thankfulness the mountains exultant they stand the seasons rejoice in your faithfulness all life is sustained by your hand you crown every meadow with color you paint every shade in the sky each day the dawn wakes as an
common things also we share is that it is all by grace that we are saved so that we can boast in nothing but Christ alone. He is all we have and all we need. I once was lost in darkest night, yet thought I knew the way, a sin that promised joy and life had led me to the grave. I had no hope that you would own a rebel to This morning. Father, your word in Psalms 150 says, Hallelujah. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty expanse. Praise him for his powerful act. Praise him for his abundant greatness. Praise him with triumphant blast. Praise him with harp and lyre. Praise him with tambourine and dance. Praise him with strings and flute. Praise him with resounding cymbals. Praise him with clashing cymbals. Let everything that breathes praise the Lord. Hallelujah. So, Father, we come here this morning to do that, to praise you.
to praise you in our worship through song, through prayer, through the hearing of your word. Father, we come to praise you with our lives that as we've witnessed in baptism this morning as well, for those that <clears throat> will tell others of your greatness through acts of obedience and how you've worked in their lives and in their hearts. So, Father, we praise you this morning for these things. And, Father, as we continue, we uh, want to lift up our like-minded partner church, East White Oak and Carlock and Pastor Scott there this morning and their congregation. And we pray, Lord, that you would use East White Oak as a light in their community as they continue to reach out into the inner city and to reach those who need to know you, Father. We pray that your name would be praised from their lips and in that community that those that come in contact with this church and those of members of it would just know that they love you and that their light is shining for you there, Father. And we lift up our Go Sent partner, Amanda King, as well. And we just pray for the ladies' Bible study and that the women in there would come to know you as their Lord and Savior, and especially for Gladys, her landlady in particular, she asked for prayer there. And Father, I continue to pray for boldness to speak the gospel truth there where Amanda serves. And Father, we praise you there as well for the new apartment that you've given her, that she's settled in well and it's working well, and that as well as that she's able to mentor new missionaries and manage her administrating work for Sim there. So Father, we thank you for giving her these abilities and for using her in this area of her life. Father, also lift up our GO-supported partner, Cameron and Roe, this morning. And Father, we just again praise you for what could be a potential opportunity soon for Cameron to plant a new church in North Carolina. Father, how you've moved amongst these people. So may our tongues praise your name for your greatness here as well as we've prayed for these things and you have answered these prayers. Father, we last but not leastly pray for moms this morning and for Mother's Day, for those that have children and, and, and our mothers and those who uh, are mothers at heart that invest in the lives of those that they come in contact with young men, boys and girls, Father. We just pray that you would bless them this morning, that they would understand the importance of the role they play in the lives that they touch. Father, I lift up Pastor Kevin and just pray that you would use him this morning to teach us from your word and that we would have ears to hear and that you would work in our hearts through what he brings us this morning. And we pray these things in your name. Amen. Before Pastor Kevin preaches, would you please stand as we sing a song that reminds us no matter what type of sin or how often we sin, wherever sin abounds, grace abounds all the more, and Christ will forgive. Marvelous grace of our loving Lord, grace that exceeds our sin and our guilt. Yonder on Calvary's mount outpoured, there where the blood of the Lamb was spilled. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that will Pardon and cleanse within 
Thank you. Oh, it's such a privilege to celebrate God's grace with you on this Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day to all of you who are moms today. It is such a joy to worship Jesus together and celebrate that His grace is greater than our sin. Amen? His grace is greater than our sin. Hallelujah. God has certainly treated all of us better than we deserve, and so... Let's continue our worship now by opening our copy of God's Word to Romans chapter 3 today. And if you do not have a Bible with you, we have Bibles. We would love to give you a copy of God's Word. Just raise your hand and we would love to get a a copy of God's Word to you because today we're going to be traveling all over Scripture and it will be very helpful for you to have an open Bible in front of you. Now, certainly the sinfulness of sin is not your traditional Mother's Day message, okay? <laughs> so, but before we dive into our new preaching series in Ephesians, and we encounter there this grand manifesto of the sovereignty of God in our salvation, I thought I should first carefully set our table with the sinfulness of sin. After all, the glorious doctrines of God's election and predestination that are revealed in Ephesians chapter 1 are God's grace solution for our sin problem. (laughs) And so we will never understand rightly God's sovereign grace until we first grasp the sinfulness of sin. So if you're all psyched up and ready to jump into Ephesians chapter 1 this morning, be patient. (laughs) This is just like when our family moved to California. Because, you know, a family would invite us over to their home for a dinner in California. And we'd show up at 6 o'clock at the appointed time because here in central Illinois, when you show up for somebody's house for dinner at 6 p.m., you expect that you're going to get there. And by 6.05, you're probably going to be sitting at the table and saying the prayer and, and eating. But in California, we'd show up at 6 o'clock and they hadn't even started the grill yet. And so we'd have an hour or two of appetizers and, and hanging out before we'd ever get to eat. And so that's what's happening today, all right? Today is a theological appetizer. It's a palate cleanser before the meal that's coming in Ephesians. But we must see, we must see what Scripture actually teaches about sin's consequences inside us. We're going to look at many different passages today, but I've chosen Romans chapter 3 for our scripture reading. So if you're able, I'd invite you to stand in honor of the public reading of God's word. I'm reading from the ESV translation from Romans chapter 3, starting in verse 9, that's going to help us consider the sinfulness of sin. Romans 3, 9. What then, Paul writes, are we Jews any better off? No, not at all. For we have already charged that all people, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin. As it is written, and now he's quoting from Psalm 53 or Psalm 14. Both of those Psalms are actually parallel. As it is written, None is righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks for God. All have turned aside, together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asp, that's like a viper, is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. In their paths are ruin and and misery. And the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For by the works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes the knowledge of sin. This is the reading of God's word. You may be seated. Please pray with me. Oh, Father, 
You are the God of marvelous grace. You are God of abundant mercies. And we are so thrilled to continue our worship in the preaching of your word today. We've seen baptisms, we've sung songs, we've prayed together already. And Father, your spirit is at work among us in this place. You are, you are doing a mighty work, Father, in our hearts right now. And so I just pray that, oh spirit, that you would be the teacher. Oh, God, please remove distractions from us. Please empower the preaching of your word as we, as we race through all of these different scriptures. Father, we're going to need your help. Please illuminate our understanding. Cause us to see what your scripture is saying and believe it even when it's different than what we thought. Father, I'm praying this morning for a strong spirit of humility that you would use my teaching to truly bless this church family. Oh, strengthen our robust understanding of our own sin, that we might be humbled, and that you, oh God, might be greater glorified among us. We need you. We ask for your help in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I am so excited to teach this particular message to you today. I'm thrilled. I'm so eager. Both of my barrels are loaded. I hope you have your seatbelts on and your crash helmets on. We're going to have some fun racing through scriptures today. But I would admit that I have prayed extra hard for you this week. And I'm going to try to approach this particular message with a little extra care for you. Because I am well aware that no one actually believes naturally, no one naturally believes what the scriptures actually teach us about our sin. Apart from humble submission to God's word, no one in the world is going to agree with what I'm about to teach you. The sinfulness of sin is a very unpopular topic. And one that most people, even professing Christians, despise and reject with strong emotion. To rightly understand God's word and and what God's word teaches about our sin, it's actually devastating to our pride. It's contrary to so many of our natural assumptions about who we are and how we relate to God. So please listen carefully. I have no desire at all to be a bully from the pulpit. I simply want to teach you what God's word says. I desire to show you what Jesus says. I didn't used to believe what I'm about to teach you from God's word. In fact, I'm convinced no one is born believing a biblical theology about sin. But our theology matters. And I sincerely, to put, I sincerely desire to put my faith and trust in what God's word actually says more than in any human tradition or any human religion or any human philosophy. Therefore, if you experience any strong reactions as we go through the scriptures today, or you have strong questions about, well, But wait a minute, that is totally okay. Just write your questions down so that you don't lose them and then pray for spiritual understanding and for humility and let your questions drive you deeper into the text of God's word. The local church here at Newcastle Bible Church is a very safe place for you to wrestle with your questions about God and his grace and our sin. I know our pastors and our elders well enough here to know that if you have any questions about these things and we can try to help you, we would love nothing more than to be able to sit down and open God's word with you and try to help you find answers to your questions from God's word. Now, today's sermon has two parts. In the first half, we're going to examine what God says about the spiritual consequences of sin in our hearts. And then in the second half, we're going to delight in how God himself overcomes sin's effects in a miraculous salvation. 
And hopefully in this way, what I'm going to do is set a beautiful table for our upcoming series that will start next week in Ephesians. So first, let's consider how the Bible teaches that sin so corrupts our hearts that only God could save us. Anyone born to a sinner automatically inherits a sin nature. And what this means is that ever since our first parents disobeyed God in Genesis chapter 3, the entire human race is corrupted by sin and personally engaging in sin. You say, well, what is sin? Sin is just rebellion against God. Therefore, ever since Genesis chapter 3, Every person on earth has failed to love God and love others the way that God deserves. Every one of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and we rightly deserve sin's penalty. But Scripture reveals more than sin's penalty of death. Scripture also reveals how sin has corrupted our minds and our wills while we are still living. For example, open your Bibles now to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, where we learn that sin makes us spiritually deaf or unhearing. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, the Apostle Paul is defending his, his gospel ministry and his humility in his gospel ministry by explaining how he wanted the people's faith to rest on God's power and not human wisdom or human eloquence. And then he makes this profound statement in verse 14, for the natural person, that's referring to the unbeliever, the non-Christian, a person who has not yet been born again by the Holy Spirit, the natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him. He is not able to understand them because the gospel is spiritually discerned. The teaching of the scriptures is spiritually. So did you catch that? The believer, the unbeliever, excuse me, the unbeliever is not able. Notice it doesn't say they are unwilling. It says they are not able able to understand the gospel message. Sin so corrupts the human heart that it makes us spiritually deaf to the life-saving message of the gospel of Jesus Christ our Lord. So notice this then, no sinner can ever be humanly convinced to believe in Jesus. No amount of persuasive apologetic evidence will ever cause an unbeliever to believe in Jesus. 1 Corinthians 2.14 is clear. The message of Jesus' substitutionary death and resurrection for the salvation of sinners, that's foolishness to unbelievers. Sin makes us spiritually deaf so that we're unable to understand spiritual truth. Now flip on over to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 3 where we learn that sin also makes us spiritually blind. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3 verses 14 to 15, Paul is describing how sin hardens our minds. So that even when we read scripture, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over our hearts. Now think about this. This means that sin blinds us from being able to truly understand or see God's salvation for us. Chapter 4, verse 4 says it even more clearly. In their case, speaking of unbelievers, the God of this world, little g meaning Satan, in their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. Translation, sin so enslaves the heart to Satan's deception that sin makes us spiritually blind. 
It's not that we see Jesus and purposefully reject him. Sin so blinds us that we can't even see Jesus as desirable. Now, let's go back to Romans because I want you to see a very couple important verses in chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Not only does sin make us spiritually deaf and spiritually blind, but according to Romans 8, verses 7 to 8, sin makes us spiritually unable, or you could say it this way, spiritually powerless. In Romans 8, the life of the flesh is against the life of the spirit. So verses 7 and 8 are talking about unbelievers, those who are hostile against God and against his spirit. But I want you to see carefully how much sin corrupts our minds. Notice Romans 8 verse 7. The mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Now that is a very strong language, isn't it? Notice, this does not say that sinners will not submit to God. This says sinners cannot submit to God. Sinners cannot please God. These are strong statements of ability. So make no mistake, sin so corrupts our hearts that we are spiritually deaf, we are spiritually blind, we are spiritually unable to please God. We cannot make any decision for God. We cannot obey any part of God's law in our own strength or in our own flesh. Sin makes every soul profoundly powerless to do anything that would be pleasing to God. And of course, sin is never morally neutral, right? So let's observe now from the Old Testament how sin makes us spiritually evil according to Jeremiah chapter 13, verse 23. Here the prophet Jeremiah asks some very obvious questions. First question, can the Ethiopian change his skin? Well, of course, the right answer is no. <laughs> no one can change their own skin color. Okay, so then what's the next question? Can the leopard change his spots? Again, the answer is obviously no. So then follow the prophet's argument. Then also you can do good who are accustomed to doing evil. Translation, a person who is born into sin has as much hope for doing good as an Ethiopian has for changing the color of his own skin or a leopard has for getting rid of his spots. Sin so corrupts our hearts that everything we do is evil and vile to God. You'll say, now wait a minute, Pastor. You went too far with that statement because I know an unbeliever who's actually a pretty nice guy. I know an unbeliever who does some really good things. In fact, some of my unbelieving, unbelieving friends are very moral. They're very generous. But listen carefully to what the prophet Isaiah has to say in, verse, in chapter 64. In Isaiah 64, verse 6, God's prophet says this, We have all become like one who is unclean, and all of our righteous deeds are like a polluted garment. Did you catch that? You say, Kevin, um, can you translate that polluted garment? What does that mean? Yeah, the words polluted garment are very graphic in the original Hebrew. It's gross, but it's literally a pile of rags that a woman would use to clean herself after her menstrual cycle. So God is saying this, any external good that you're able to do in your own strength is unclean filth. Any human morality apart from my spirit stinks to high heaven with self-righteousness and pride. 
Sin has so corrupted us that even external morality, even our most sincere religious acts are evil and wicked before God's holy eyes. Sin makes every part of us spiritually evil. Now, brace yourself, because sin doesn't just make us evil enemies of God. Sin makes us spiritually dead. Sin doesn't just make us spiritually deaf and blind and unable and wholly evil, but sin makes us spiritual corpses. Ephesians chapter 2 says every person is dead in trespasses and sins. We are by nature, by our very nature, children of wrath. What does that mean? That means every human being is spiritually dead, enslaved to Satan's deceit and demonic lies, living as a child of disobedience, and only useful by our nature as objects for God's righteous condemnation. This is a real upbeat message for Mother's Day, isn't it? I know this is offensive to our human pride, but this is the clear teaching of Scripture. So mothers, don't misunderstand what I'm saying. I'm not recommending that the next time you go to a baby shower, that you address the card to the walking dead or to the cute viper in a human diaper, right? You don't have to do that. But let's humbly acknowledge that there's, biblically speaking, there is no such thing as an innocent or a spiritually neutral person. Nowhere in the Bible does it teach an age of accountability. After all, even infants and severely handicapped die. And death is the direct result of sin. All have sinned. All people carry a sin nature. And sin is far more destructive to our hearts than we may have ever dared to dream. Sin makes us spiritually deaf, spiritually blind, spiritually unable, spiritually evil, and spiritually dead. Sin deceives us into thinking that we are sophisticated and we are competent even while we are literally spiritual corpses drifting down the river of humanity towards an eternal hell of righteous condemnation. Remember what James 2.10 says, whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become accountable for the entire law. Therefore, loved ones, according to God, what God says in his word, no one has an excuse. We are all justly condemned before our holy creator. Sin has so corrupted our hearts that we could never initiate, nor could we ever desire our salvation. So let's draw two implications before we continue. First, sinful hearts are only free to do evil. How many of you have heard, you can raise your hands, how many of you have heard that God has created us with a free will? Have you heard that before? Have you heard the words, the free will of man? Sure, a lot of us have. That's a very common belief among Christians, right? And just because the words free will aren't found in Scripture doesn't necessarily mean it's not true. After all, the word Trinity isn't found in the scripture, and we still believe in the Trinity, right? But we must define the free will of man according to what the Bible actually says. So if we understand the free will of man to refer to the fact that God created every person to make their own choices, then that's biblically true. After all, God created every person morally responsible and accountable to choose to worship him and obey him with their life. However, what we've just learned from our study of sin is that sin has so corrupted the human heart that now sinful hearts can only choose evil. 
Titus 3, verse 3, explains that unbelievers are actually not free to choose righteousness. But instead, unbelievers are slaves to various passions and pleasures. So a biblical understanding of free will cannot mean that sinners have an ability to choose God. Sin has taken away that ability. Sinful hearts are spiritually unable. Sinful hearts are only free, quote unquote, to do what they want to do. And sinful hearts will only want to do what is selfish and pleasing to themselves, which leads to all kinds of relational brokenness like the rest of Titus 3 goes on to teach. So let's submit ourselves to a, a biblical understanding of man's free will. And let's make sure our understanding of our free will is submitted to what Scripture teaches. Biblically speaking, sinful hearts are only free to do evil. Or to say it another way, although we are eternally responsible to repent and believe and choose Jesus, sin's corruption makes it impossible to seek God ourselves. Clearly, listen up, church. God commands every person everywhere to repent. God commands us to believe in him. So biblically speaking, the doctrine of the free will of man teaches the moral responsibility of every person to choose God. If you want to write this down in your notes, if it's helpful, say biblical free will equals Moral responsibility to choose God. But sin has so corrupted our hearts that no sinner will ever choose God on their own. We are enslaved to sin's passions and therefore we will only do what we want to do, which is evil. We cannot understand God. We cannot see God. We cannot please God in our flesh. We are spiritually dead. And as we read earlier from Romans 3, no one seeks for God. No one will ever decide to follow Jesus or receive Jesus on their own. It is a biblical impossibility because of the pervasive corruption of sin upon the heart and mind of the worshiping soul. By the way, what I'm about to say deserves about 15 minutes. I don't have 15 minutes, so I'm just going to say it, leave a bomb, and go. But the sinfulness of sin is what prevents us from viewing God's sovereign election as merely national to the Jews. The sinfulness of sin is what prevents us from merely understanding God's election as just looking down through the quarters of time and seeing the people who are going to choose him and then electing them based on their future choice. If God's election is merely foresight, then no sinner would ever choose God because of sin's consequences on their own mind. So then quickly now, let's move on to our second point. And let's rejoice because our God is the author of our salvation. God himself does what sinful hearts could never do. Hebrews 12, 2 says that Jesus is the founder and perfecter of our faith. Jonah 2, 9 teaches that salvation belongs to Yahweh. And when Moses questions God and says in Exodus chapter 33, God, how are you going to dwell and live with such a stiff-necked and sinful people? God responds in Exodus 33 by assuring Moses, I can live with the sinful people because my name is Yahweh and I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and I will show mercy to whom I will show mercy in other words the miracle of our salvation includes God's rescuing grace to save us from the corruption of sin in our own minds and wills this is awesome this is awesome now unfortunately we're going to spank the next blanks in your notes very quickly well you don't have time to fully expand on the glorious 
doctrine of God's salvation today. But remember, today's just the appetizer. The meal is coming when we get into Ephesians starting next week, so you got to come back. But I want you to notice the parallelism in your notes as we go through these. We're often looking at scriptures in the exact same context that we considered before. First, go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And note how God, God gives us spiritual hearing. By his saving mercy, God gives us a spirit so that we might understand the things freely given to us by God. So the Apostle Paul's preaching didn't rely on persuasive rhetoric or human wisdom, but on God as he imparted the gospel in words that were taught by the Spirit. The spirit who interpreted spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. In other words, only those who are spiritual, those who have already received the spirit of God, are able to hear and understand spiritual truth. And then in 2 Corinthians chapters 3 and 4, God is the one who mercifully gives us spiritual sight so that we might believe in Jesus Chapter 3, verse 16 says, When one turns to the Lord, the veil of blinding unbelief is removed. Now, if we only had verse 16, we might think, well, what, well, wait a minute. What removed the blinding veil of unbelief was my choice to turn to the Lord. But when you keep reading, we realize we didn't actually choose to remove our blindness but God's spirit did, which is then what caused us to turn to the Lord. For verse 17 says, where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And then more clearly said in chapter four, verse six, for it is God who said, let light shine out of darkness. He has the one who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus. So God saves us from sin's blindness. God opens our spiritual eyes to see Jesus so that we treasure him above all else. Isn't that glorious? Love what our God does in salvation. Now go back to Romans chapter 8 to see how the Spirit of God overcomes our spiritual inability. God gives us spiritual ability through the Spirit of Jesus, who's always with us. Romans 8, 13 says, By the Spirit, we can put to death the deeds of the body and truly live. Now, now wait a minute. Because back in verses 7 and 8, Paul said that we cannot submit to God's law and we cannot please God. But listen, that was before we were born again. That's before we were given God's Spirit. Now that God himself is with us, we have a spiritual ability to please God, to obey God, to fight against sin in our life by the power of his spirit in us. This just keeps getting better. <laughs> now look at Isaiah chapter 61, verse 10, which teaches that God gives us spiritual righteousness. Remember back in Isaiah 64, God taught that even our own best religious efforts are like a pile of menstruous rags on the floor. But now rejoice at what God does in our salvation according to Isaiah 61 verse 10. The prophet says, I will rejoice greatly in the Lord. My soul shall exalt in my God for he hath clothed me with garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness just like a bridegroom decks himself like a priest with a beautiful headdress and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. Loved ones, listen, please. Salvation belongs to our God. And when he hides you in Christ, and when he makes you one with Jesus, he declares you perfectly righteous. Wow. Our salvation glorifies God. Only a God of resurrection power could transform people who are accustomed to doing evil and dead and give us spiritual righteousness and life. And of course, this is exactly what God does. Ephesians 2 verse 4 says, Because God is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, 
Even while we were dead in our trespasses, God made us alive together with Christ. No wonder Ephesians 2 exalts so much in the triumph that we are saved by grace alone. We could have never saved ourselves. Sin has so corrupted our hearts that only God could ever save us. So rejoice, church, that God alone is the author and the initiator of our salvation. God alone gives spiritual hearing. God alone gives spiritual sight and spiritual ability and spiritual righteousness and spiritual life to the soul. Which then helps us to draw two important conclusions today. First, write this down in your notes. Saving faith, saving faith is a grace gift from our God. <laughs> Although we are biblically responsible to put our faith in Jesus, sin's consequences on our heart make that action impossible. No sinner will ever seek God apart from God giving them the gift of saving faith. This truth is actually all over the scripture. And we're going to spend a lot more time unpacking it through Ephesians. But for now, just consider verses like Acts 13, 48, which says, As many as were appointed to eternal life believed. So notice, their saving faith or their belief in Jesus was a result of God appointing them for salvation. Or in John chapter 6, Jesus clearly teaches that faith is a grace gift when he says, it is the spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. This is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it has been granted him by the Father. You see, God doesn't wait to react to our faith before he saves us. Saving faith itself is part of God's rescuing grace. In John chapter 10, Jesus makes this point crystal clear when he teaches, you do not believe because you are not among my sheep. Now notice, that's backwards for how most of the evangelical church teaches today. Most teach that you're not part of God's flock because you don't believe. But that's the opposite of what Jesus just said. God is the author of our salvation. And when he saves you and he makes you one of his children and he makes you one of his sheep, then you will believe on him. And then you will love him. If we said it all another way, we could say it this way. Although we are eternally responsible to believe and repent. Only God gets the credit when we do believe. Salvation belongs to our God. So while the sinfulness of sin means that our sinful hearts are only free to do evil, according to Titus 3.3, Titus 3.4 goes on to marvel at God's freedom. God's marvelous and gracious sovereign freedom to save sinners. For when God's goodness and loving kindness appeared to us, he saved us. Not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy. By the washing of regeneration, by the renewal of his Holy Spirit. So then the salvation of a sinner is entirely God's choice. Our salvation owes absolutely everything to Yahweh and his grace. This doctrine of God's sovereign grace in our election certainly has much mystery. It has much wonder and much awe to it. But just as the end of Romans 11 exclaims, who has known the mind of the Lord? Who has been God's counselor? Who has given a gift to God that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things, including the salvation of sinners. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. 
So now then, the sinfulness of sin has become a glorious table setting for Paul's grand manifesto of God's marvelous salvation that we're going to discover in Ephesians chapter 1. After all, sin so corrupts our hearts that only God can save us. The biblical teaching about the sinfulness of our sin requires necessarily that every part of our salvation, even the first heartbeat of saving faith, must be the supernatural and miraculous work of God himself. And in this way, God sovereignly works to save sinners all in a manner that most humbles our pride and exalts his own glory. Oh, may God help us, church, to rejoice that our God alone is the author of salvation. May our hearts be satisfied in his saving love as we submit all of our understanding to the authority of his word. Let's pray. So, Father, we thank you and praise you that you are a God that is far greater than us and far freer than us. And I pray, Father, that you would help us to submit to this glorious teaching uh, that is so devastating to our pride and so exalting of your glory. Your name is Yahweh. You are the I am who I am and the I will do what I will do. There is no God like you. So humble our pride and help us to trust you. Give us faith that we might please you in all things. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. And please stand with us as we sing to the Lord and thank him for the divine intervention that he brought about in our lives to save us.
That is such good news. Uh, after a message like this, you know, there's, there's a couple ways we could be responding. Uh, one is like just overwhelmed and crushed by the absolute pervasiveness of sin. And where your sin has abounded, grace abounds even more. So if you are caught in sin, if you are overwhelmed by your sin, oh, flee to Jesus. You say, but, but you told me that I, I won't ever choose it. Oh, if you are desiring Jesus right now, if you are wanting, that is a proof that God loves you and that he's drawing you and that his powerful grace is at work in your life. So exercise that grace and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. It's a glorious thing. If you're convicted of your sin, that's not of Satan. That is of the Lord. So believe, repent, come, and see Jesus as beautiful. You say, but man, I have a lot of questions after a message like this. Great. Don't lose them. Write them down. We do a podcast every week as pastors where we try to answer some of the questions that, that you have. So send us emails. Uh, communicate with us. We'll try to answer your questions through the podcast and in the upcoming series. Like I said, today's the appetizer. We're just getting started. So come back and stay soft, stay teachable, stay humble, open your Bible, and let's see what God's going to teach us as we work together through this text for his glory. It's all for the praise of his glory, church. He's an amazing God of salvation. So we're going to pray our benediction from uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 23 to 24. So would you pray it out loud with me as we go? Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. And all those who are recipients of God's amazing grace would say, Amen. Amen. You are dismissed. Amen.